Hello everyone, back to you to today's second video, doing Gaz Love is Sunny Roundup for today's second video. So as always on a Sunday, we're going to have your eclectic mix of this and that. We're looking at things like stir activity, sea surface temperature, anomalies, ENSO, the AO, the NAO, and of course the weather for the next week to 10 days as well. Have a CFSB2 for next month at the end of the video. So a lot to cram in and hope you find it interesting and informative for your Sunday afternoon uh, viewing. I uh, just say that the second batch of summer analogues has been released. That video is currently here on the homepage at Gazub. It's later on today to be placed on the summer updates page. There'll be a written summary going over everything that uh, we discuss in that video. It's looking at winter to summer analogues um, today. So uh, that video will be placed on the summer updates page this evening. And there'll be a written summary that just goes over everything that we discuss in the video. So you'll be able to watch the video on demand when you want. And also have a read of that written summary if you would like to do that. Right, so let's get on with the uh, Gazwell with Sunday Roundup. We're going to start off by having a look at the um, reanalysis for March so far. So up to the middle of March, we see a very different pattern for this month compared to what we've seen in many months recently. Uh, very low pressure dominated pattern. So um, we see that... Uh, for this uh, only provision up to the 14th, but up to the middle of March, basically we have a trough of below average height centred over and to the north of the country, also going out into the Atlantic with above average heights down to the south. So it's a classic westerly setup, bringing the jet stream across the Atlantic into uh, the UK like that. So it's a reason it's been such an unsettled first half of March. Low pressure has been in control, been thrown weather systems in across the country, been very windy, of course, uh, as well over the past couple of weeks and a real change on the um sort of circulation pattern that we've had for quite a long time it's quite a long time now that we've had such a westerly and atlantic driven month as this so um properly unsettled but that's probably going to change a little bit for the second half of the month because you only see a more anti-cyclonic second half to uh march so we will probably with this reanalysis, see the trough of below average heights tending to weaken a little bit and get pushed a bit further northwards from there. We'll probably see this area of above average heights here kind of like expanding northwards um, over the next week or so on these reanalysis charts. So actually, we might finish up um, with a reanalysis chart that looks something like this. This was from the winter forecast. Uh, the top two analogues for the winter forecast were 1914 a 1938 and that always suggested the chance of quite a mild winter for march it was suggesting uh sort of a westerly march with below average heights to the north of us and above average heights to our south uh bringing in a westerly flow and i don't think when we come to the end of this month i don't think that's going to be a million miles away uh actually from how the reanalysis for March um, 2019 uh, ends up. It won't be identical. You never get a total like-for-like -like match. But I reckon this will look fairly similar in the end to uh, to this. So, uh, again, the analogues from the winter forecast are holding up very, very well uh, at the moment. And uh, this westerly, relatively mild March um, was expected. And uh, it looks like uh, it, it's uh, it's happened. So, or it's happened. So um, I don't think that uh, reanalysis that we have there, I mean, that's just up to the first half of March. I don't think in the end that reanalysis chart will be too far away from um, the top two uh, reanalysis or an the top two analogue chart from uh, the winter forecast. It'll be very interesting to come back in a couple of weeks, have a look at that. Right, this is what's happening on the solar disk on our side of this today from soham.net. So we've got a spotless solar disk uh, today. There's no sunspots at all. Another very quiet day on the sun, as you'd expect, being uh, in solar minimum. Uh, now, solar ham is reporting that um, solar activity is going to remain at very low levels, or is at very low levels now, and will remain, uh, it's forecast to remain at very low levels for the next three days at least. This is the Gazovic Sunny Roundup Solar Activity Tracker, updated to today, 17th of uh, March. So, uh, again, very, very low levels of solar activity. Now, being sent through and updated by a good friend, James Axe. So, big thank you, James, sending this through. Uh, again, we see very, very low levels of solar activity. The orange line is depicting each day's uh, sunspot number. So, you see we're getting these regular long runs now, sometimes lasting up to a month without any sunspots 
whatsoever. We did have a couple of sunspots uh, a few days ago. So we did see that orange line ticking up a little bit. Now we're kind of like flat uh, again with that uh, orange line telling us that again we're going into another uh, period without any sunspots at all. The trend lines, the thick green and the thick red lines, they are on the floor of the chart. So uh, again, we're just at a really low level of sun activity. We're going to remain at this level for at least the next six months, probably the next year or more. Um, we won't know when we have left solar minimum and entered the new solar cycles, number 25, until it's happened. It should happen sometime in the next year, but we won't know uh, when it's happened until it actually happens. You see what I mean? It's something that you can't really forecast when that's actually going to, uh, to occur. Uh, so, again, we're at soda minimum and we're going to remain at soda minimum for the next uh, six months, probably the next year or more. So, um, expect to have a continuation of very low levels of solar activity. Big thank you, James, for sending that through. We're going to be doing the Gavs. Yeah, we're going to be doing Solar Sunday. Uh, we'll be doing Solar Sunday on Easter Sunday, on Easter uh, Sunday this year. So, um, watch out for that. That's Samden Solar Sunday since uh, for a very long time. I think it was last summer when we last did uh, Solar Sunday. So, um, we'll be doing Solar Sunday uh, in uh, April on Easter Sunday. So, do uh, watch out for that one. Uh, this is how Siberian snow cover and Eurasia snow cover is looking at the moment. So, uh, again, we've got quite good uh, snow cover still going across Scandinavia, actually. The far south of Sweden uh, doesn't have much snow cover, but many other parts of Scandinavia uh, look like they've got a decent snow cover holding on. It's been pretty cold, um, Mark, so far across Scandinavia, although I, although I suspect it's going to start warming up a bit as we get through to uh, next week. Most of Europe is now snow-free, uh, except over the mountainous areas, of course, over the Alps, those sort of areas, then there's still plenty of snow around. But much of Europe is now snow-free. The snow line has pulled back to the uh, sort of European-Russian border, and the whole of Russia is still covered uh, with the snow, basically. There's one or two little areas, little patches, but, uh, where the snow has um, mounted a bit across southern parts of uh, Russia. But essentially, most of Russia still snow covered. That's still snow covered, as you would expect, uh, in March. This is going to start to unravel, of course, over the next couple of months. We will see uh, a four a four out taking place across Scandinavia and Russia by the time you get through to June and July. Most parts or all parts of Russia will be uh, snow free. But at the moment, still quite a lot of snow across Scandinavia. They're still doing pretty well, I think. Right, sea surface temperature anomalies in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans uh, next. So we've got our three areas of interest, of course. We've got the Enso region uh, just there, and then we've got the Northern Pacific Ocean up here, and then we've got the Atlantic Ocean uh, over there. This is how the sea surface temperature anomalies were looking in the oceans uh, when we did last week's uh, gas of sending around. So this was taken uh, from NOAA on the uh, 7th of March. Uh, that's how things were looking last week. This is the very latest. So um, let's deal with the ENSO region first of all. We're perhaps seeing a little bit of a cool down in the ENSO region overall. And you'll notice that in the far eastern part of the Enso region over towards that coast of that kind of like Peru and up towards uh, Mexico. It's actually turned really quite cold all of a sudden uh, up there, which is a bit of a surprise. There wasn't much sign of that uh, last week. Again, that's how things were looking uh, last week. So just a little uh, spot of um, cold and average sea surface temperature anomalies there uh, last week. But obviously that's intensified a lot over the uh, over the past week because that's how it's looking now. Remember, that's in towards the coast of Mexico and Peru. So uh, it's going to be very shallow waters. Those waters there are going to be prone to rapid temperature changes both up and down as the weather conditions change. So I doubt that is a sign of La Nina beginning to get going. I doubt that's a sign of uh, a cold. Man. Famous last words, of course, but I'll be surprised if that uh, is a sign of uh, La Nina. I don't think there's much support under the surface of the uh, Pacific Ocean at the moment for a cold vent. So it's not much in the way of uh, cold and average subsurface temperature anomalies. We will look at this in the ENSO update 
in a week or so's time, by the way, much more, much more in depth. And we'll have a look at the subsurface temperature anomalies there. But I don't think there's much support subsurface wise for a landing. So I suspect what's going on there is that it's just a very um, rapid drop in temperature and sea surface temperature anomalies caused by weather conditions that are occurring around Peru and uh, around Indonesia. So it looks quite dramatic. That is quite a big drop in the temperature that's taking place there. But I don't think it's necessarily a sign that uh, we're going into a landing event. In the uh, deeper waters of the middle of the Ector Pacific Ocean, so these are really deep waters that we have just here, and uh, they're less prone to temperature changes with the weather. They're much more cyclical uh, when, the, um, when the temperature changes there. So uh, in that area, we're still keeping the signature for a weak El Nino. Possibly it has weaker, though, uh, compared to, uh, to last week. So uh, last week we had those sort of orange type colours in that area. Now they've faded back more towards yellow. So I think all Enso regions have cooled a bit in the past week, but obviously the most dramatic uh, dropping temperatures taking place over here within the shallow waters next to um, Peru. Going further north, very little change in the northern Pacific Ocean. So uh, it's all looking quite stable up there. We have this colder area just here over towards the coast of uh, Canada and North America going up towards Alaska. It's a bit warmer up there. Overall, very little change happening there. In the Atlantic, again, all looking quite stable, uh, really. We possibly, uh, we possibly have seen this colder area of sea surface temperature anomalies that we do seem to have, a, have very regularly uh, over the years, um, over the past two or three years, just uh, recently. Uh, we've possibly seen that cooling a little bit. That's possibly gone a little bit colder over the uh, past week. So that area of cold of an average sea surface temperature anomalies in the North Atlantic, possibly expanding again. Uh, otherwise, it's a bit cold and average over towards the coast of Africa. Again, these are going to be shallow waters. They're prone to rapid temperature changes down towards the tropical Atlantic. It's looking, uh, it's looking quite warm down there. Again, overall, not much change on uh, last week. The North Atlantic and the North Pacific looking quite uh, quite stable. It's the Enso region where there has been a little bit of change, particularly uh, with those cold of an average sea surface temperature anomalies suddenly appearing over towards Peru and Mexico. Again, I don't think that's the sign of uh, landing you're starting to develop, but obviously we'll be keeping a close eye on it. Southern Oscillation Index is uh, quite stable, so uh, you'll remember that uh, back in February we had a dramatic crash of the SOI. It's one of the reasons we saw El Nino strengthening through February, which is quite unusual for that to happen. Normally El Nino will be declining through uh, February, and the same is true uh, for La Nina too. They, they reach their peak around Christmas and they tend to decline away through the first uh, months of the, of the next year. But this February, we actually saw El Nino strengthening. It was mainly because of the, uh, um, the, the crash in the SOI. The SOI is an index that's reflecting the atmospheric state in the Southern Pacific Ocean. It's measure, measuring air pressures between Darwin and Tahiti. And when the SOI is negative, it tells you that the atmosphere is in an El Nino state. And through February, the atmosphere went into a very strong El Nino state. So, for example, on the 19th of February, we went down to minus 43.61. Uh, and on the 20th of February, down to minus 38.91. So those are exceptionally negative SOI numbers. And so the atmosphere was in a strong El Nino state in the Southern Ocean, coinciding, by the way, with the um, with the winter heat wave that we had in the UK and in Europe too, interestingly. But um, because of that crash in the SOI and that strong atmospheric uh, state in terms of El Nino, that allowed these um, sea surface temperature anomalies to strengthen, become uh, a, a stronger El Nino signature through February. Well, the latest is that uh, it's much more stable uh, now. So it is still reflective of El Nino, as, as you would expect it to be. But uh, nowhere near as negative with the SOI. So we sort of gain these kind of numbers uh, on the 10th of March down to minus 12. On the 11th of March down to minus 16. That's quite negative. Uh, on the 12th of March going down to minus 14. 13th of March minus 14 again. 14th of March quite negative. Um, minus 17. 
And then sort of 15th down to minus 8, 16th of March down to minus 9, and 17th of March, very latest, again, minus 9. So these are negative numbers. They are reflective of an El Nino, but they're not exceptionally uh, negative. They're not those sort of minus 20, minus 30, minus 40 numbers that we was getting back in February. So obviously the atmospheric state in the Southern Ocean is still uh, reflecting an El Nino, uh, but not a strongly, uh, uh, not a, not strongly so, just uh, generally in an El Nino uh, type state. Um, so we wait and see where we go uh, next. It's still early days to determine whether we're going to see this El Nino strengthen and take it, take off through the summer or whether we'll revert back to uh, Enso neutral as we would normally do through the spring. Or indeed, whether we'll uh, move from El Nino to uh, La Nina. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, we'll know more when we get past the spring predictability barrier. Uh, so that in the spring, it's always very difficult for the models to be able to predict where uh, Enso is going to go next, be it either El Nino or La Nina. So we're just going to wait and see a little bit longer where this is going to go next. But definitely the strengthening of the El Nino signature that we have in February has backed off uh, through the course of March. Arctic Oscillation observed and forecast chart is looking like this. So the black line tells us where we've been with the Arctic Oscillation. The uh, red lines at the end with GFS Ensembles forecasting the Arctic Oscillation to go. Remember again, this is just an index that's reflecting the atmospheric state. Same as with the SOI. The SOI is reflecting the atmospheric state in the Southern Pacific Ocean. The Arctic Oscillation is reflecting the atmospheric state in the Arctic. And all of these indexes are just telling you what the atmosphere is doing. They're not driving anything in their own terms. They're just telling you what's going on within the atmospheric state by looking at, uh, at the atmospheric pressures. So where we are right now with the Arctic Oscillation is uh, in a very positive state. We have been since we uh, started February. That's when the uh, Arctic Oscillation started trending up, was into positive territory. Uh, so since the middle of February, we've been in a um, prolonged spell of positivity of the Arctic Oscillation. We're just there right now on the positive side with the AO. GFS Ensembles are forecasting that the Arctic Oscillation will stay positive at least for the next week. Possibly a few hints when it begins to uh, drop back towards neutral or maybe goes uh, into negative territory in the second half of March. They're probably, though, outlier members, though. So I think most members of the GFS ensembles are keeping the Arctic Oscillation positive through to the end of March. Um, and these indexes normally move in blocks of like two, three months. So it will be a bit early, really, to start getting the uh, Arctic Oscillation going back into negative territory. So I would suspect we'll keep positivity of the AO going through to the end of March. That tells us we've got low pressure up over the poles. So if we just go back to this chart, so uh, obviously that's showing a lot of low pressure up here around the pole. That's the reason that the Arctic Oscillation is uh, is um, is negative. So it, that's the reason the Arctic Oscillation is positive, I should say. When you've got lots of low pressure up over the pole, the Arctic Oscillation will be in its positive phase. So it all connects together, really. The um, low pressure over pole is uh, sending the Arctic Oscillation into its positive uh, phase. When the Arctic Oscillation goes negative, then you'll get high pressure appearing over the uh, North Pole. So expect the positive phase of the AO to continue for some time uh, yet. NAO observed and forecast chart is looking like this. So again, the black line tells where we've been with the NAO. The red lines at the end where the GFS ensembles are forecasting the NAO to go. So this time we're measuring the atmospheric pressures between Iceland and the Azores when the... Uh, when the um, NAO is positive, but you're going to have low pressure around Iceland, you'll have high pressure through the Azores, and you'll strengthen the uh, westerly flow. We've been in a very prolonged and pronounced phase uh, of the uh, positive phase of the NAO right the way through winter, and now going on into the spring. So that's where we are right now with the NAO. We are in uh, positive territory. GFS ensembles over the next week to 10 days, forecasting the uh, NAO to stay positive as well. Few signs again, similar to with the AO chart, few signs that as we get towards the end of March, we might start to see a little bit of negativity creeping in within the NAO. But again, I suspect those are outlier members. Uh, they're in the extended range of those GFS uh, runs anyway, so we're kind of like talking 
about days uh, 10 to 14 or days 10 to 16. So I think basically we can say that for the next week to 10 days, we're keeping the AO and the NAO in positive territory. So signal for West East to be strengthened. But of course, as we saw in February, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be wet because if the Azores high strengthens enough, then it will push the jet stream to the north of the UK and we'll find ourselves under a mid-latitude area of high pressure which at this time of year is going to be quite pleasant it'll bring mild temperatures and uh, pretty dry uh, conditions and I think that's what we've got coming up in the next uh, week to 10 days or so so although the Arctic and North Atlantic oscillations are telling us that the Westies are very much strengthened, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to carry on being uh, very wet. Expect the Azores high to become more influential over the uh, next week to 10 days. And we'll get on with the uh, doing a bit of forecasting now. So we can look at the uh, GFS upper air temperature and precipitation ensembles. We're looking at Rumford in Essex uh, today. So this is another suggested place on our list of um, locations. Please submit your uh, area, your uh, local town or city that you would like to see in this section of the video. We're pretty much through the list now, so um, please get on with uh, submitting your local uh, town or city. We can't go down to village level yet. Maybe one day we'll be able to, but at the moment we can't go down to village level, but we can go to uh, your local town or city. So please submit where you would like to see within this part of the videos uh, next. Anyway, Romford uh, today. So, um, a bit cold on average uh, at Romford at the moment. Going to stay that way into tomorrow as well. But after that, the uh, temperatures are taking off. They're lifting up. So, in the coming week, going to see much milder uh, temperatures occurring. And it looks like we stay milder on average, really, as we go through to the end of, uh, end of March. I mean, we've got the start of April appearing uh, over there. Uh, and overall, it looks like the trend within the GFS ensembles is for a prolonged spell, another prolonged spell of above average temperatures. There are a few cold outlier members uh, down here, and I suspect those ones would be tying in with those GFS ensemble members that are sending the uh, AO and the NAO negative in their extended ranges. So you're always going to get a range of options within any ensemble uh, suite, and you will have some that are doing something a little bit different. But overall, most of those members of the GFS ensembles are keeping the upper air temperatures above average from around the middle of this coming week onwards. And you'll notice very dry now as well. So the first half of March has been really wet, but it looks like that's running that's running out of the uh, road now. And it looks like the rest of March, and even into the start of April, just looking really, really dry. Now remember this is in the far southeast of the country. So, it's going to be one of the driest places in the country. Uh, if we looked at somewhere exposed to the Irish Sea or exposed to the Atlantic, it would probably look quite a bit, uh, quite a bit more unsettled. But it's a, it is a signal to tell us that high pressure is coming back and we're going on to the drier side. There'll probably be some precipitation at times in the next couple of weeks. Probably won't be completely dry for the whole two weeks. We do see the odd precipitation spike even on this chart. But essentially, it looks like we're going into a much, much drier phase of weather for the second half of March compared to the first half. So we've had some very useful rain to uh, help us make up the rainfall deficit through the first half of March. But it doesn't look like that's going to be sustained through the second half of the month. We should wait and see when our next period of wet weather comes along. Temperature anomalies from the 17th to the 25th of March. Uh, overall, a little bit on the uh, uh, on the mild of an average side, above average temperature anomalies coming up. Precipitation anomalies, look at that, I said... When we've been looking at these through the past few days, and they've been looking quite unsettled, I've said once we get Saturday's deluge out of the way, I expect these uh, charts to trend dry, and that is indeed exactly what's happened. So now the precipitation anomaly from the 17th to the 25th of March is looking much, much drier than average. A really dry uh, week coming up. So mild and dry uh, once again, or maybe even high and dry. This is how the temperature anomaly is looking over in America. So many uh, central and western parts of the states going a bit above average now, though it does vary from area to area. But generally, it's a bit milder in the west. Over in the east, it's still quite cold. Um, precipitation anomalies show that eastern parts of the country, where it's coldest, it's also driest out in the west and through those um, sort of southern areas. It does look a little bit wetter uh, there. 
This is how the operational uh, GFS was looking in terms of the midnight run of the GFS. So we've got high pressure on Wednesday to our south, low pressure to the north. It's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a mild middle part of the week. Temperatures up to mid teens Celsius, probably with quite a lot of cloud. But as this high pressure strengthens, I suspect, particularly for England and Wales, uh, we will start to see a lot of that cloud breaking up. Through to the end of the week, high pressure remains well and truly in charge of the weather. It's just a little bit wet and windy for the north early next weekend. This is Saturday, 23rd of much just looking a little bit wet and windy then with that area of low pressure but once that gets out of the way the high pressure just kind of re-establishes itself uh, once again we'll bring some cooler air down though next weekend so temperatures will drop uh, a bit at least for a day or two but uh, overall, high pressure all the way, really. This is taking us up towards day 10. High pressure continues to be well and truly in control on the midnight run of the GFS operational. So that's how we look at day 10. High pressure is sitting over and just a little bit to our east. We're drawing in an east to southeast wind. I think that will be mainly dry and quite pleasant conditions. And this high pressure fest continues into the extended range uh, as well. So as far as we can go with the GFS at the moment is to choose the 2nd of April. April. Oh, we're still more or less dominated by high pressure. Its position is subtly changing day by day. So at this point, the high pressure is up to Scandinavia, but it's not particularly cold. We're still drawing wind in from kind of like a southerly to southeasterly direction. So relatively pleasant conditions even into the start of uh, April. This is the GFS parallel uh, midnight run. So again, we have that uh, high pressure building to our south through the course of this week, bringing a lot of dry and mild weather. Just goes a bit more unsettled briefly next weekend, and then the high pressure re establishing itself as we get through to Monday, the 25th of March, moving up towards day 10. This is day 10, uh, Wednesday, 27th of March. We've got the high pressure to our east, low pressures out to the west. So perhaps a little bit unsettled for northwest Scotland, but most places would be dry there and it would be uh, very mild maybe even potentially quite warm. In the more extended range, the parallel GFS run does turn things a little bit more unsettled, at least for a while, but then it finishes up uh, for the start of April with high pressure again, becoming quite influential this time, sitting just out to our west. The uh, 6 o'clock run of the GFS has been updating us with, with, as we've been doing this video so we'll just have a quick look at that we've got to high pressure again on wednesday to our south bringing up those mild southwesterly winds uh, mild and mainly dry conditions continuing to the end of the week uh, next weekend this is saturday 23rd of march goes a bit wet and windy up across scotland it's still mainly dry for england and wales and then as that low pressure gets out of the way by Sunday the 24th, the high pressure is re-establishing itself. So as we get to day 10, high pressure is well and truly in control. It's sitting to our east. It's drawing up these very mild or maybe even locally uh, quite warm southerly to southeasterly winds. In the more extended range with the 6 o'clock uh, GFS run, this is what happens. So uh, we try and turn it a bit more unsettled, but we never really get rid of the area of high pressure and uh, eventually we do start to break the Atlantic through as we get through to the final day or so of March. It does turn a little bit more unsettled, uh, moving to the start of April. That's very extended range stuff, though. It's not to be relied upon, and certainly within the next week, 10 days, high pressure is well and truly in charge. ECMWF, again, mild, dry conditions, maybe quite warm through the second half of the coming week. Bit cooler and a bit more unsettled to start the weekend, but then the high pressure re asserts itself and as we get up towards day 10 high pressure just uh, just continues to dominate so we remain mostly dry up to day 10 and generally on the mild side may be quite warm at times the position of the high pressure its, its exact position will change subtly day by day and that means there will be temperature changes day by day dependent on where the exact wind direction is from but overall this is looking like a mild and dry second half to march these are the options that are on the table within the ECM ensembles today via the postage stamps at the Icelandic Met Office. This is for day 10, as we just saw, that is the 27th of March. So we've got 12 members of the ECM ensembles that are placing an area of high pressure right over top of the UK. Uh, jet streams being pushed off at there, so obviously those are very dry and uh, pretty mild or maybe even quite warm members of the ECM ensembles. There's another 11, again, that have the high pressure 
almost over the top of the country. There's 10, just that includes the control and operational uh, ECM runs as well, by the way. So the operational is the run we're just looking at. Uh, there's 10 that have the high pressure just a bit further northwards. So they're perhaps bringing some cooler winds from the northeast, but they're still very dry. Uh, then there's seven. They take the high pressure even further north. They take it up towards Greenland and Iceland. So those ones would be cool, bring wind down from a northerly direction, maybe a bit showery. There's seven that have the high pressure over and to the south of the country. So again, they're mainly dry. These ones are mild uh, and maybe a little bit unsettled for the far north of Scotland, but essentially those ones are um, pretty dry. And then there's four that have the high pressure, again, pretty much centred over the top of the country. So it's all just very subtle variations within those scenarios. It's just very, very slight and subtle variations in the exact position of the high pressure. But basically, they are all in agreement, really, that up to uh, day 10 or at day 10, high pressure is very, very dominant indeed. Now, these are the options that are on the table in two weeks' time. So this is taking us to 360 hours. It's the 1st of April. Uh, we've got 14 members of the ECM ensembles with high pressure to our south and low pressure is uh, up to the north. So they're a little bit more unsettled, especially for northern parts of the country. They are bringing the jet stream back across the Atlantic uh, rather like that. So for the north, a little bit more unsettled. For the south, still probably mainly dry. There's 13 that have the high pressure pretty much centred over top of the country, so they're pretty dry as well. There's nine, though, that have the high pressure out to the west of us and low pressure is coming back to our north. So they're turning things more unsettled with westerlies returning. Uh, those nine through the start of April. There's seven that look quite unsettled with low pressure in the Atlantic and to our south, so they're a more unsettled option as well. There's six that have a trough of low pressure over top of the UK, and then there's two that have low pressure out to the west. So it does appear that the ECM ensembles are possibly hinting at a breakdown of this high pressure for the start of April. It's a long way off, it's two weeks away, um, but maybe the signs within the ECM ensembles are that things could start to turn a bit more unsettled for the start of April. But again, I have to re-emphasize that is two weeks away, so it is quite unreliable. Finally, the CFS V2, these are 500 millibar heights broken down into uh, week periods. The first week period takes us from the 17th through to the 23rd of March, with above average heights extending in from the Atlantic into the UK in the week ahead, below average heights up to the north. Jet streams go north, so we're under high pressure. We're on the mild side of the jet. It's going to be an increasingly pleasant spring-like week ahead. And this goes on into week uh, two as well. This would be 24th. Uh, through to the 30th of March with above average heights again centred across central uh, parts of Europe and to our south. Low pressure is out to the northwest. The jet stream is going up there too. So you would expect once again we have a lot of dry and uh, pretty warm weather. Uh, with that, we would be drawing wind up from a sort of southerly direction, be it southeasterly or southwesterly. The air is coming up from the south, so it would be very uh, mild, maybe even quite warm at times. Week three, this is the 31st of March to the 6th of April, with above average heights again very close to the country, so the high pressure fest goes on. And then as we get through to week four, uh, again, we're dominated by high pressure, really, this is the 7th to the 13th of April. This time, over high pressure is pulling out to our west a bit, which would start to send the jet stream a bit further southwards. So we would perhaps turn a little bit cooler and maybe a little bit more showery with that. Although, having said that, high pressure is still more or less dominating weather. Very, very much a case of high pressure in control, even into the start of April with the CFS B2. In terms of April itself, with the CFS, this would be 700 millibar uh, anomaly for April. Uh, at the moment, today, it's forecasting, again, an area of above average heights, high pressure over and to the east of the country, which would be drawing wind up from a southerly to southeasterly direction. You would expect, uh, expect a mild month and you expect a dry month with that scenario. Temperature anomalies are being forecast to be uh, mild of an average during April to go for a warmer than average month. No real signal for precipitation, but with that area of above average heights over to the east of us, I would say suspect it would be a pretty dry month, uh, to be honest. Very consistent signal within the CFS at the moment for April to be dominated by high pressure. So I think that's the most likely outcome, uh, particularly the early part of April, although there's a few hints there within the uh, extended GFS and ECM ensembles for some sort of change from the start of April. 
I'm a little bit dubious about it. I would suspect actually we're likely to see this high pressure possibly lasting into the beginning of April. But we should wait and see about that. Certainly the next week to 10 days, so it's going to be dominated by high pressure. Right, so that's it for Gazwell. We're setting round up for today. Uh, so don't forget to check out those summer analogues if you would like to do that. That video will be placed on the summer updates page this evening with a written summary going over everything that we discuss in the video. But uh, that's all for now, and thanks for watching.